We are in the book of Hebrews again today, Hebrews chapter 5, and so if you have your Bibles with you, flip to that section. We're going to spend a little bit of time in some other texts today as well to try to understand a little bit of the background to what we're talking about today. But Hebrews chapter 5 will be our main text, and we'll jump around a little bit from there. So as always, the uh, chapter today is perhaps not divided as, as is totally helpful uh, to the to the thought of the author. Um, And so it's necessary to recap a little bit of where we're coming from, knowing that this was meant to be read as a book and in a a wholeness, and we're really artificially breaking it down into sizes that we can talk about in one Sunday. And so one of the things the author has been doing from the start of this book is arguing that Jesus is better than the Old Testament systems of sacrifice. And so he said, he's already argued that Jesus was a better way to communicate with mankind, with humanity, than the angels, than the prophets, and even than Moses. That the ways in which Jesus is able to connect with you and I are greater than the ways in which even those great people in times past were able to connect people to God. And in order to to make those arguments about Jesus being better, one of the things the author does repeatedly, and will do again today, is state clearly and highly that Jesus is God. That if Jesus wasn't God, these arguments wouldn't make sense. That he wouldn't be better than the angels, he wouldn't be better than the prophets, he wouldn't be better than Moses. He would be similar to them. But being the God-man, he understands humanity and understands God because he is God and he is man. And so he is best suited to communicate the ideas of God to man and the ideas of man to God. And he acts in that way today is presented as the high priest. We began talking about this last week, and this is perhaps one of the more unique contributions of the book of Hebrews, is the idea that Jesus is the high priest. He is the one who takes on that role on our behalf. We saw that a little bit in, uh, in the end of the chapter last week, and so I'm going to recap by reading the last part of last week's chapter, which is the introduction to this week's. Uh, Hebrews 4, verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. The role of a priest was that they would present sacrifices to God. They acted as a conduit between humanity and God for the sacrifices that God asked of the people. This text speaks of Jesus as the great high priest. He represents us to God and stands in as the ultimate sacrifice at the same time. He is both priest and sacrifice. The text reminds us that Jesus understands us, that he knows what we're struggling with and what we're going through, that we can approach him in confidence because he both understands where we're coming from and is the one who can provide grace and forgiveness. He knows what it is to be tempted, and yet he did not sin. And even more so, he still understands the results of sin. For the sin of the world came upon him at the cross, and he experienced separation from God. And how much more that experience would have been for someone who truly understood God and what his presence means. And so Jesus sits as the one who both can truly understand what we're going through, and yet because of his perfection, his righteousness, can sit in the very throne room of, room of God and speak to the Father. And out of that, you and I can approach the throne of grace with confidence to receive forgiveness from our sins, knowing he understands and has a right to be there. Picks up this idea or continues with this idea of Jesus as high priest in chapter 5. So let's read chapter 5, verse 1 through 10. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself himself. 
but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, you are my son, today I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is a better priest. Earthly priests had to begin by offering sacrifices for their own sins. They were fallible humans. And we see this failure of priests time and time again in the Old Testament. Aaron was the beginning of the line of Aaronic priests. And yet, in Numbers chapter 12, we see that his failing nearly leads to his death before God. He comes in opposition to Moses along with his wife, and this was deemed to be sin, and God nearly strikes him down. We see that Aaron's line fails from the start. And we see the same from Aaron's sons. And so in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 10, I'll read a, a, little, a little bit of this in chapter 10, sorry, verse 1 through, th through 3. Aaron's sons Nadab and Abihu took their censers, put fire in them, and added incense. And they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Moses then said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke of when he said, among those who approach me, I will be proved holy. In the sight of all the people, I will be honored. And Aaron remained silent. In this text, we see that Aaron's sons sinned by taking a sacrifice in a way they were not instructed to and was contrary to God's words. And God proved himself holy perfect, incapable of having sin in his presence. They were struck dead, consumed by fire. The ironic priesthoods of our time were imperfect men. They failed. They were fallible. They sinned. And so the text reminds us that they needed to begin by making a sacrifice for their own sins before they could address the sins of the people whom they were to serve. Jesus doesn't need to do that. He's a better priest. He did not sin in and of himself. And more than that, he doesn't require us to bring a sacrifice because he is the sacrifice. He is in all ways a better priest. Now there's a name that probably stood out in this that we don't talk about much, very often in Western churches, and that is the name Melchizedek. How many have heard that name at least a few times before? Yeah, a few, most of you. Good job. You've read a few texts. It's, it's important. I'm, I'm proud of you. Um, it's probably a name that we don't talk about very often, but is an important one in Scripture. And it is important partly because he seems a little unique. We're introduced to him in the book of, of Genesis. And it's a really, um, when you read the book of Genesis, it kind of pops as a strange story. Because you're reading along the story of Abraham and God revealing himself to him. And then seemingly out of nowhere, this king, Melchizedek, the king of Salem. Salem, we think, might have been Jerusalem, but we're not 100% sure. But he was king of a city called Salem. And he's presented and described as a priest of the Most High God. And so in this story about God revealing himself to Abraham, this other story seems to be happening that we're completely unaware of. That God in some way has revealed himself to another group of people and even anointed and appointed a high priest for them called Melchizedek. Here's the story in Genesis chapter 14, starting in verse 17. And Abraham returned from defeating Kedorlaomer. I tried to pronounce it even in my office and I couldn't get it right. And the kings allied with him. The king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shavah, that is the king's valley. 
There's been a war in the region and Abram has gone and fought against a, a, a neighboring nation in order to return a nephew that was kidnapped. He comes back to the area in which he lives and this is the interaction that he has with those kings. Picking it up in verse 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. And then Abram give, gave him a tenth of everything. We see in this text that Melchizedek is presented as an authentic priest of the God Most High of Yahweh. And Abraham acknowledges that too in how he interacts with him. There is no, no testing of that, no question of that. He is a priest. And yet the Aaronic priesthood won't start for a long time in the future. This king Melchizedek was appointed by God to be priest. And the text reminds us that that is how priests are appointed, by God. That he chooses who will be priest. And just as he chose Melchizedek in times of old, he has chosen Jesus to be high priest. And if we carry this through and understand our role as priests of God, as believers, that we have a role, a description of priests, we understand that God has appointed and anointed us as well in a minor way to that role. Not in the high priest role, but in a role as priests below the high priest. We'll talk about that more in a few minutes. This isn't the only place that we find the name Melchizedek. Why can I... Melchizedek in the Old Testament. There's one other spot and it's found in Psalm chapter, one, Psalm ch chapter 110 and I'm going to read the whole thing. It's this conversation about God and David's Lord interacting. And so there's these spots in the text where it has the name Lord capitalized. That means it's speaking about Yahweh or the, the one we often refer to as God the Father. And it says that, that David is also answerable to Yahweh and to someone else Else that he calls Lord. And so the king of Israel, the one appointed by God to lead, is acknowledging that there is someone who is Yahweh, who is God, and there is someone else that he also acknowledges as Lord. And so I'm going to use the word Yahweh when that's the word that's used in the Old Testament, and I'm going to use the word Lord so that we can understand these two different people that David is writing about or speaking about. This was always understood as being a messianic text. People understood that this was speaking about God and the Messiah to come. That these were the two characters that David was writing about. And so in the text, it says, Yahweh says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Yahweh will extend your mighty scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing on your day, to, day of battle, arrayed in holy splendor. Your young men will come to you like dew from the morning's womb. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge the nations, heaping up the head... The, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. He will drink from a brook along the way, and so he will lift his head high. One of the things that we've talked about is that when writers in the New Testament quote from the Old Testament, the Jewish reader would often understand that the context was important, that he was referring to the whole chapter, not just the verse. And I think in this case, it's especially true. In chapter 5 of Hebrews, verse 6, he quotes this verse from Psalms 110. This verse about Melchizedek. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And so he's saying more than it looks like he's saying. He's saying Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Lord referred to in the text. He's the one that David calls Lord. He is greater than David. He is the Messiah. He is the one that you have been waiting for. He is the one that's described in this text. And so it's an acknowledgement that Jesus is priest and is king from the order of Melchizedek. 
So what is this idea of the order of Melchizedek? It's one that is appointed by God. And Jesus had this unique lineage. He could, he could have claimed and, and has claimed that he's connected to Aaron. He is connected to the priesthood of Aaron. And yet, he's unique in and of himself, that he's called by God for a unique purpose, just like Melchizedek was. And so he's a high priest appointed by God for a special purpose. Now, I alluded earlier that we are also called to be priests, and we perhaps see this most spelled out clearly in 1 Peter 2.5. We're speaking to those that are followers of Christ. Peter says, You also, like living stones, are built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So we're called to a form of priesthood as well, answerable to the high priest submitted to him, but to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through the high priest, Jesus Christ. And so verse 7 gives us an example of what that looks like in our daily life. It gives the example of Jesus' life here on earth and how he fulfilled that understanding. In Hebrews 5 verse 7, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. We could probably use a little more reverent submission in our world these days. Far too oft we, often we set ourselves up in a place that elevates us in ways we're not meant to be. But Jesus understood his role and he was reverently submissive to God the Father in a beautiful way as an example to you and I of how we are to be submissive to God. The final part of the chapter is the third warning and we've talked repeatedly about the first two warnings and how they make us a little uncomfortable by design. They're meant to make us uncomfortable. They're cautionary tales. They're warnings to heed the writings of the author. They're warnings to pay attention to what God is doing and to maintain holiness in our lives. And so we come upon this third warning in chapter 5 verse 11 to the end. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. The text reminds us that far too many of us are comfortable where we're at. That we're not willing to do the things and sacrifice in a way that brings us closer to God. Or as he describes it, we're used to the milk and haven't moved on from it. He makes this statement that some of their fault is that they no longer try to understand what God's about. I think in the times that are coming, there may be seasons once again where we are isolated from one another. And it's a good reminder that you are meant to play a role in your own spiritual growth. That it's not just about someone standing up front and presenting ideas to you, but that you are meant to struggle and try to understand what Scripture says. That solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. That we all have a role in training ourselves in understanding the things of the Spirit. And that we are meant to be engaged in those practices. That we might grow in our understanding of who God is. This week in one of my prayer meetings, I was talking about how I longed for things to go back to the way they were before COVID. And I had a friend who rebuked and corrected me as friends are meant to. He said, you shouldn't long for things to go back the way they were. They weren't that good before COVID. 
And he described how he feels this, this reality that the writer of Hebrews lays out was so true for his congregation and for many around the world. That we were comfortable. That we weren't striving to understand God's word. That we were okay drinking milk and just doing life. He said, why would you want to go back to that? Now, in my heart, of course, I wanted it to go back like that so it would be, life would be so-called normal for my children. I long for them to live in a world where physical contact is normal, where relationships can be restored, where those things that bring humanity into us are practiced. But he's right. I don't want things to go back to the way they were once spiritually. I want greater things. I want better things for them. I want them to experience God in a way that is meaty and not just milk-filled. I want them to hear and understand God in ways we haven't. I don't want things to go back to the way they were. I want things to be better. The writer of Corinthians speaks this in talking similarly about his, uh, those he has discipled and their lack of maturing. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1 through 3, he says, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? I think in this season, the ability to distinguish good from evil, to understand what's going on around us, to see past the physical to the spiritual realms is going to become more and more important. And perhaps it's going to become even more necessary for us to do that as individuals to distinguish good from evil. And it speaks that mature believers are those that are trained in the practice of doing so by constant use. And so the warning is to prepare to drink, to to eat the solid food, to not be satisfied with the milk, to not be content where you're at in your relationship with God, but to move forward to choose to do so, to engage in habits that make it come about, to practice spiritual disciplines that bring about new life. By constant use, by prayer and petition, by conversation with God, train yourself to understand the difference between good and evil. Plant your feet firmly in the truth. And it is a heavy call. And so I invite you, as the text does, to explore your lives, to examine whether you're drinking milk or solid food, to look at whether you're moving from one to the other, whether you're advancing in your understanding and knowledge of Christ and experience of his spirit, to discern whether you want to go back to the way things were or move ahead to something better. Our world certainly feels like it's in a place of transition, And I don't claim to know any more than you do what's coming. But I long to be one who eats solid food and recognizes good from evil. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, your your scripture today challenges us to explore our own lives, to see if we are maturing in our faith and understanding of you, and to do what we need to, to bring about our own spiritual well-being, God. I'm thankful, Lord, that we're able to gather today. I'm thankful for the fellowship of believers. I'm thankful for the ways we encourage each other. And so much of your word speaks of what's meant to be as we gather together in fellowship. And it's right for us to focus on those things. It's good for us to be about those things. Today's text reminds us that we are responsible in some ways for our own spiritual growth that we are called to take responsibility for some of those things. God, that might be uncomfortable for some, but it certainly seems to be what the text is saying. So Lord, I pray that we would explore in our own hearts whether we're moving towards you or away from you, whether we're stagnant or growing. And if we acknowledge, Lord, that we're moving away from you or stagnant, may we decide today 
to do what we need to, to grow in our faith and understanding of you. Then, Lord, may we come into your presence, confess our sin, and move past it in a way that is reflective of the grace that you have offered, a grace that is not meant to be taken lightly by repeatedly coming to you to seek forgiveness for the same actions that we haven't truly repented of, but a grace that is meant to grant freedom from those sins. So God, explore our hearts, speak to our minds, share with us your will for our lives, that we may understand the world around us and what you're doing within us. We may be transformed by your spirit and brought to action in this world. In your name we pray, amen. Brandon, if you'll come lead us. as we close. <clears throat>